Uh, thank you, Timmy, for the generous introduction. Timmy is a fellow co-alumni in the College of Public Health. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizing committee of Fondation Meru and Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines, uh, particularly Dr. Nancy, and then Dr. Uh, Valentina Pico for the opportunity to speak to you uh, today, this morning, on the topic post-COVID syndrome. I am really happy uh, to see you all face-to-face, -face, no? uh, colleagues and partners in the fight against this uh, pandemic. So this is, I think, second time that I'll be uh, presenting face-to-face -face after all the virtual <laughs> presentations. So let's start. Uh, okay, so I have no financial disclosures related to this presentation. Uh, I just have to disclose that uh, long COVID is now one of my interests in research, and I'll be mentoring students in the College of Medicine uh, to work on this research. And I'm also working with uh, Dr. Press Klimakosa in the College of Public Health on a cohort no, looking at genetic, immunologic, and neurological consequences of uh, COVID. So those are my intellectual disclosures. So I'll walk you through the epidemiology and management of COVID-19 for this morning. Actually, I had, it was not easy no, to summarize the literature that's available in COVID-19, in COVID, especially uh, long COVID, no? as you know, there's really an infodemic of articles. And uh, as we speak now, I'm sure uh, there is a lot more uh, that is being published or out in the, posted in the preprint archives. Okay. Um, for this morning, my talk will be mostly data from foreign literature. As you will see, uh, we don't have much data yet in the country. So we uh, research for long COVID in the country is still being uh, set up. So what is uh, long COVID or post COVID syndrome? I think uh, this, the term long, long COVID actually came to our awareness. Came to our consciousness, I think, the latter part of 2020. So there were case reports coming out no, describing the syndrome of long COVID. So there are many terms used to refer to post COVID syndrome. Long COVID is the most commonly used and probably the first term no, that uh, came out. And uh, we call those patients who, who suffer these symptoms as long haulers. No? Okay. Now CDC and WHO use the term post-COVID condition. NIH uses the term post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. Then down the line are the other terms. So which is the right term? No? And what is the definition of uh, post-COVID syndrome. Okay. So let's go through the definitions now. No? So uh, you've seen that there's a lot of terminologies no, uh, in the first part of the pandemic. So in 2021, uh, it was recognized that there's a need to standardize no, the case definition for COVID, for long COVID. And it was termed now as post-COVID-19 condition this is the ICD-10 classification, no? uh, and that was born out of the uh, global consensus uh, meeting organized by WHO uh, in October 2021. So that is when they came out with a standardized uh, case definition agreed upon by stakeholders uh, based on literature review, and so they identified what are the domains that should be included in the definition? So no, the current definition of post-COVID-19 condition is 
It's a condition that occurs in individuals with a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, usually three months from the onset of COVID-19, with symptoms that last for at least two months, cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. And uh, more common symptoms were fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction, among many others. And this should have an impact on everyday functioning. So the symptoms may be new onset following initial recovery from an acute COVID-19 episode, or it can persist from the initial illness. So it can overlap with the uh, existing symptoms if it persists. And the symptoms can fluctuate or relapse over time. So that is now the standardized uh, clinical case definition for post-COVID-19 condition. CDC uses the term as an umbrella term for the wide range of physical and mental health consequences that can be present four or more weeks after infection with SARS-CoV-2. And uh, it also considers, includes new returning or ongoing symptoms similar to WHO. So the main difference uh, between WHO and CDC is just the uh, timing. No? Uh, the WHO considers three months from the onset of COVID-19, while uh, CDC uses an earlier time frame from four weeks after the infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And the uh, reason behind no, why CDC uses the four-week time frame, no, because most patients will recover in four weeks. No? And the proportion reporting symptoms decreases uh, by four to 12 weeks, no, as shown in this graph. While, and the improvement slows down around 12 weeks after infection. So uh, the four weeks is, uh, the time frame, this is the basis for the CDC time frame, while WHO uh, considered the 12 weeks after infection no, as the their time frame. Okay. So actually, majority of cases are self-limited, as we have seen, and uh, symptoms resolve or improve in three to six months. But there, may, there can be relapsing symptoms uh, or prolonged symptoms that can last more than six months. And women and men follow the same pattern, but more women report symptoms. Okay. So to harmonize that difference, no? so the, the difference in the time frame. So this is now the harmonized this definition combining WHO and CDC. It's, so PCC or post-COVID-19 condition refers to new symptoms that affect everyday function emerging within four weeks, so the earliest, up to three months after first being infected, and then it should last for at least two months. And then these symptoms can fluctuate over time, it can overlap with uh, prolonged symptoms post-hospitalization. And again, it's important that these symptoms cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. Okay. This figure on the right you know, shows the broad spectrum of symptoms and conditions you know, by organ system that have been documented in post-COVID conditions. So you see you know, from dermatologic, uh, cardiac, pulmonary, endocrine, neurologic, uh, thromboembolism, hepatic, renal, and gastrointestinal conditions. You know? So you see that there's really a wide spectrum you know, of uh, conditions under uh, long COVID or PCC. Okay. So again, recognizing that variability, no? so we had variability in definitions, we had also a wide spectrum of uh, presentation of, PC of uh, PCC. Again, the WHO organized another global consensus process to come up with a core outcome set no? for adults with post-COVID-19 condition. So, uh, this uh, core outcome set no, is um, meant to optimize uh, comparisons and synthesis of research data and to ensure consistency of care. No? So these are the 11 uh, 
core outcomes no, that reach consensus among the stakeholders. So these are the ones that should be measured no, in uh, ex uh, when you are assessing your patients and if you are doing research on long COVID. So it's grouped into physiological or clinical outcomes, life impact outcomes, survival, and then recovery. So under physiologic or clinical outcomes, uh, we have fatigue or exhaustion, pain, post-exertion symptoms, and then uh, symptoms and conditions under the cardiovascular, nervous system, cognitive, mental functioning, respiratory functioning, and then uh, we have outcomes that have impact on physical functioning, work, or occupational and study changes. Okay. So we'll uh, go through details of that in the succeeding slides. Okay. So uh, here, I just like to show you the challenge really you know, in understanding post-COVID conditions. So we've seen, as I mentioned, variability in definition, variability in outcomes. We saw a wide range of physical and mental health consequences experienced by patients. And then as studies, it's difficult also to summarize the studies be because it includes different patient populations, hospitalized, non-hospitalized. And then the assessment of occurrence of symptoms and conditions are done at varying time points following acute infection. Many studies do not include control groups. And then the severity and impact of symptoms on quality of life or daily activities are not consistently reported. So with the standardized case definition and the core outcomes, then uh, we hope to be able to have a better uh, analysis no, and better comparison of data across countries. So here again, as a result of this, those challenges, we see variable uh, reports on the prevalence of long COVID. Uh, depending on whether it's from self-reported or symptoms or based on electronic health data. So here uh, we see self-reported symptoms. This is from a mobile app done in UK. So among uh, UK participants, the symptoms range from 13.3% occurring one month or more after the COVID infection to 2.5% occurring three months or more. And then based on electronic health data, this is from the US Veterans Administration of uh, non-hospitalized adults with COVID-19, 7.7% experience one or more of 10 identified uh, late onset conditions, one to four months post-infection. And then uh, was also shown in this uh, electronic health database from the Veterans Administration that the frequency of at least one symptom at six months differs by severity of acute COVID. So here, so the occurrence you know, of uh, post-COVID condition is higher among ICU and hospitalized patients compared to non-hospitalized patients. So you see a variable uh, range, no? depending on the timing on when it was uh, determined. Okay. Now this is uh, probably the most most updated uh, to date, no? As living systematic review, which uh, looked at controlled studies. No? So this is the first systematic review looking at controlled studies. Uh, this was uh, posted uh, August 2022. They updated their first uh, review that was uh, completed last year. So this update includes 28 studies no, up to February of 2022. And it included studies that have at least 100 uh, people with confirmed or clinically diagnosed COVID with onset of symptoms at an average of 12 weeks or more no, following WHO definition. So this review uh, analyzed 200, more than 200,000 patients with COVID-19 and another 200 plus thousand controls in 16 countries. And we can see here that majority or 56% are female. And here we see the dirt of uh, data no, from low middle income countries. Most of the studies were from Europe, Africa, the 
high middle, high income countries, only two from low middle income countries, and very few included children. Okay. And the longest follow up was 419 days. And in this uh, systematic review, it was shown that COVID 19 infection was associated with an increased risk 1.5 times uh, of experiencing persistent or new symptoms. No? that can last for a year or more compared to controls. And uh, the core outcomes that had the highest increased risk no, or frequency were cardiovascular functioning here. So the, the bigger circles are the ones with the highest increased risk of occurrence. So cardiovascular, which includes chest pain, palpitations, cognitive, functioning, which includes impairments in concentration and memory. Then physical functioning here, uh, which includes uh, difficulty ambulating, limited activity, worsened quality of life. No? And then other uh, reported long COVID signs and symptoms here with, aside from the top three, uh, we have uh, nervous system, uh, functioning, which is affected, then uh, pain, fatigue or exhaustion, and then other symptoms such as chills, fever, skin rush, uh, sleep disturbances. Okay. Then here's another, uh, sorry, recently published also, uh, population-based study, also a big study. Uh, this time uh, it's conducted in Germany involving 11,000 participants, okay, looking at post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, six to 12 months after infection. So the earlier systematic review is uh, 12 weeks. This one is longer, six to 12 months and the New symptom clusters that were found to persist beyond six to 12 months no, in this uh, study were fatigue, neurocognitive impairment, chest symptoms, uh, chest pain, smell or taste disorder, and anxiety and depression. Okay. So I'll show you the, this is the uh, diagram no, or the figure, sorry. Um, showing the network no, of symptom clusters. Okay, so the bigger the circle, the more frequent is the occurrence no, of the symptom cluster. And then uh, the lines here show the, uh, the relationship, the co-occurrence no, of these symptoms with each other, okay? So here it was, we can see here that uh, the bigger circles, again, fatigue, neurocognitive symptoms, chest symptoms, are the ones that uh, are most frequent and that they occur with each other. Okay, and then aside, smell, smell, loss of smell or persistence of smell or taste disorder was reported independently. Then you have anxiety or depression, headache, dizziness, musculoskeletal pain, upper respiratory systems, and then skin manifestations, okay. Uh, the outer circles are the symptoms that are part of the clusters, no? So under fatigue, we have um, chronic fatigue, and then uh, rapid uh, physical exhaustion. Under neurocognitive, again, it's a memory and concentration difficulties, memory disturbance and uh, concentration difficulties. And then under chest symptoms, we have shortness of breath and chest pain no, as the most common symptoms. Okay. And then this uh, forest plot shows us the uh, impact no, of these uh, clusters, no, symptom clusters on the overall general health and work capacity. So the top three, again, no, uh, fatigue, neurocognitive impairment, and chest symptoms uh, contributed to an average overall loss of general health of 11.5% and 10% uh, 
uh, average overall loss of working capacity. So the impact no, of these symptoms is on the general health and work capacity. Then just a few words on uh, the cognitive symptoms, which you see that turns out to be always in the top three. So you've probably heard the word, the term brain fog, no? which uh, refers to difficulty thinking clearly and concentrating, forgetfulness and memory loss. So uh, under the neurocognitive uh, domain, the most common impairments reported were memory and attention deficits, followed by deficits in fluency, executive function, which involves planning and organization. And uh, these uh, symptoms were frequently reported in both hospitalized and uh, non-hospitalized patients, and 18% were reported among moderately to severely ill uh, hospitalized patients. No? compared to 9% in the those with mild COVID. Okay. And then it, at one year follow-up, 25% still report cognitive symptoms and cognitive deficits in 18% after one year. So it's, the uh, symptoms are more frequent among the hospitalized and those with severe, moderate to severe COVID. Okay. So those, that is the uh, prevalence no, of the uh, symptom clusters of post-COVID condition. Now we move to risk factors, okay. So the factors associated with an increased occurrence of post-COVID conditions have been identified in uh, cohort studies. So as we have seen er earlier, it's high, the risk or the frequency of post-COVID conditions is higher in moderate to severe COVID and among hospitalized, it was also consistently seen to be higher no, among the female sex. Those with pre-existing conditions such as diabetes, heart, lung disease, obesity, mental health disorders, multimorbidity. Age was also associated no, uh, with increased occurrence of post-COVID conditions especially among older adults compared to younger adults. It's higher also among adults compared to children. And it's also higher among the unvaccinated. So there's a lower occurrence of post-COVID condition among those who are vaccinated. However, post-COVID conditions can still occur no, among the vaccinated. So we can those who have vaccine breakthrough infections can still uh, experience post-COVID conditions. And this is a, this study from Israel on healthcare workers. Uh, it was found that vaccine breakthrough cases were generally mild or asymptomatic, but 19% had persistent symptoms at more than six weeks, no? This was in the setting of the alpha variant. And then another case control study in UK uh, showed that individuals with infections after vaccination are less likely to report prolonged symptoms compared to the unvaccinated. And then uh, this is another uh, study this time from the US, the department using the Department of Veterans Affairs database. So it was shown in this uh, study that people with SARS-CoV-2 vaccination who were not previously vaccinated, so that's 113,000, uh, when compared with people with a breakthrough infection, had lower risk of death and lower risk of having post-acute sequelae. No? So vaccination reduce the occurrence of post-COVID conditions by at least 15%. Okay. So here we can see you know, that uh, vaccines can prevent post-COVID conditions by decreasing transmission, 
lowering the occurrence of post-COVID conditions in persons with infection after vaccination than those who are unvaccinated. However, uh, we still need more studies no, to see whether this uh, association no, that, or the protective benefit that we see with vaccination is, will uh, also hold true no, with the emergence of Omicron. And with the way Omicron is behaving where in there is, it's characterized by a lot of reinfections. No? Um, so we need to see uh, with Omicron and with a reinfection with Omicron, what is the prevalence no? or the risk of having a uh, post-COVID condition? No? Because uh, as we've seen, the vaccines have been protective. So let, we are not sure with Omicron if that's the case as well. Then, uh, Okay, this graph just shows you that uh, the symptom frequency in vaccinated is less frequent no? compared to the unvaccinated individuals, especially those that received uh, two doses. Okay. So that's the uh, orange bars there. You know? So you can see that it's all uh, lower no? compared to the vaccinated with one dose and the unvaccinated, the green and the purple bars. Okay. Then again, this is another data showing that long COVID can occur after a breakthrough infection, but rates are consistently lower in the vaccinated versus unvaccinated population. And uh, two doses no, of the vaccine is protective against uh, some of the uh, symptoms no, associated with uh, post-COVID. So here the, are the, you can see here uh, the symptoms that are prevented no, by vaccination and then there are some that are not prevented, those are on the other side. Okay. okay, so we've tackled risk factors and the uh, benefits of vaccination. We move to pathophysiology. So what is the underlying biology no, or pathophysiology in the occurrence of these uh, post-COVID symptoms? No? So these are some of the hypothesized uh, mechanisms no, that lead to the prolonged or persistence or emergence of new symptoms post-COVID. So one is direct neuroinvasion of the uh, virus no, uh, into the brain, into the neurons. No? So this results in viral neurotoxicity, inflammatory neurotoxicity, microvascular thrombosis, and may lead to neurodegeneration, uh, leading to the cognitive impairments. Then there is dysregulated immune response, uh, leading to having autoimmune antibodies, autoinflammation, and uh, there can be persistence of the virus in immunologically privileged sites. No? And this is the one that is uh, responsible no? for the persistence of the uh, symptoms, no? the presence of the virus, and then the inflammatory effects uh, as a consequence of the persistence of the virus. And then uh, there's, also, there's a, also a hypothesis that it's due to endothelial injury or ongoing endothelial dysfunction. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. There. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there's still a lot of research, no, that needs to be done with regards to, uh, understanding, no? but the pathobiology behind the occurrence of, or the persistence of post-COVID uh, symptoms. Then we now move to management of post-COVID conditions. Okay, so the clinical management of long COVID is mainly 
supportive and symptomatic. No? So it can be managed by primary care providers in consultation with uh, specialists, as you have seen, no, the wide spectrum of symptoms no, uh, that can occur post-COVID. So the uh, management should be patient-centered approach, and the goal is to optimize quality of life and function. Okay. Uh, and then uh, symptom amelioration or symptomatic management approaches can include uh, re rehabilitation plans uh, such as physical and occupational therapy. So it needs to be a holistic uh, rehab plan to improve physical, mental, and social well-being. So it can include occupational speech therapy uh, symptom uh, amelioration such as breathing exercises, then exercise, okay. So it's mostly uh, supportive care, so vitamins, okay. So we do not have any definitive drug yet for uh, post-COVID conditions or long COVID. And then in terms of laboratories uh, tests, usually uh, it's recommended that a conservative approach be done, no? during the first uh, four to 12 weeks, because as we've seen, most patients will recover. So it is, if the symptoms persist, no, and that is when you will need to uh, do some investigations already, laboratory tests, no, so depending on the history and the uh, presenting symptoms of the patients, underlying medical and psychiatric conditions, personal and social situations, then you may need to do additional tests, no? So these are examples, no? These are the basic diagnostic laboratory tests to consider for patients with post-COVID. And then uh, these are the additional special diagnostic laboratory tests, no? To consider. So again, depending on the presentation, if you need to rule out rheumatologic conditions, coagulation disorders, myocardial injury, or differentiate symptoms from cardiac versus pulmonary origin. So remember, uh, one important domain in the definition is uh, the symptom cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. So that's why you will need to have to do some battery of tests no, to determine whether that uh, symptoms are really uh, from COVID or not. Of course, uh, if it's a clinically diagnosed COVID, that's the time you can do some antibody tests as well, no? so to document if it indeed was uh, COVID. And then there are other assessment tools no? to check for functional status quality or quality of life tools. No? Uh, then for neurologic and cognitive uh, conditions, so these are the cognitive assessment tools, no? mini mental status examination. So there are several assessment tools uh, to assess psychiatric, neurologic, respiratory, and quality of life conditions. Okay. Then, uh, as I mentioned, there's still no definitive treatment. All, there are investigational agents for long COVID here, enumerated here, uh, perpenidone, leronlimab, okay, inhaled interferon beta, and then there are also repurposed drugs no, that are being studied no, for their anti-inflammatory effects no, uh, since uh, we've seen in the pathophysiology that mainly it's because of uh, prolonged inflammation no, that is responsible for the symptoms. So these are the drugs that are still uh, under investigation. Okay. And in the pipeline, uh, there's a large platform trial, no, similar to Solidarity Recovery Trial. Uh, this is funded by NIH, uh, which aims to recruit 2,000 hospitalized patients wherein the volunteers uh, will receive standard of care or one of three treatments like apixaban, which is an anticoagulant and atorvastatin, a dyslipidemic agent. Okay. And, uh, as I mentioned, there is still a, a lot of research needed on biomarkers, genetic and immune mechanisms. And uh, we are, in the Philippines, uh, we are participating in the Ginkgo cohort e-Asia, which 
uh, looks at genetics, immunological and neurological long-term consequences in prospective COVID-19 cohort. No? So this is, includes Thailand, Japan, Philippines, and the U.S. And definitely we still need, locally, we still need uh, to do prevalence studies. No? So uh, we can go back to your records, no? oh, go back to our patients who had COVID, and then we can uh, conduct a survey using a questionnaire which includes no, the uh, core set of outcomes I presented earlier and then follow the definition given by WHO so that we will be able to document how frequent is it in our country. You know? Do we see the same trend? Because no? we see in uh, the Western countries, female sex is one of the uh, uh, risk factor for occurrence. Does that happen also in us? No? And then, of course, biomarkers uh, for our setting. Okay. Then the last slide, just to end, uh, uh, to remind everyone no, uh, how to prevent long COVID. So the best way is still to protect ourselves and others from becoming infected. So we need to stay up to date with vaccines. So we've seen that uh, vaccines can still uh, lower no, the risk for getting post-COVID. So we need to boost our immunity with vaccines. And then our bundles of prevention still applies, so improving ventilation, wearing masks in crowded areas, and performance of hand hygiene. Okay. So I guess, thank you for your attention.